have to respect the audience that you're going after and who your uh, stories are going to be about. And the perfect example is the uh, one that comes to mind for myself. And it also brings about the importance of why uh, black newspapers are still just as important as it was back in the day when we couldn't read no other papers. It was the only paper we could uh, read and, uh, and find out about what was going on. Uh, the Greece woman who was arrested for just trying to give her kids a better education than what she had. She was trying to just get her kids into a, a perceived school district that was better than the city schools and hoping to get them in. And for her to be arrested, for, uh, my personal opinion is that was just insane. And then number two, for the media to come out and have their mics and asking her questions as they sticking her head into the police car. I think uh, we don't see that with white citizens. White citizens, you usually see their attorney or something uh, making comments, speaking for the citizen. Because if you heard the woman speak that evening, you could tell darn well that she should not have been speaking. She should have waited until her uh, attorney or someone uh, representing her would speak to the mass media to give the commentary on what took place. And I, I also feel that uh, someone, well, we talked about it in the Challenger, uh, people wrote in, and the one gentleman made an excellent comment uh, about her case is that, hey, if, if one of her kids' sons or daughter was a good football or basketball player, I wonder would they have been quick enough to kick her out of, want her kids out of the school district? What do you think? Would they have wanted them out real quick, or would they let them come on and play and help take them to a sectional title? And that brings about another point that I wrote about in the Challenger as well, is that, hey, we had a young man I wrote about in general, but uh, I can put a name to it right now since it was in the mass media recently. You had Matt Jones. Uh, went to Wilson High School, excellent uh, football, basketball player there. They uh, acquired the institute, snatched him up, gave him a good story, said, come on over here. He led him to a sectional title, uh, got a, uh, accepted into uh, Syracuse University, but unfortunately his SAT scores did not get him in. What's wrong with this picture? That's why people go to pay to go to Aquinas in the McQuaid of the world, because they give you the extra education so that you will be able to pass the SAT exam. Now, if you're taking our city kids and taking them out to the uh, private schools just for them to play sports and not give them a quality education, then something is seriously wrong about that. And uh, I know I have written on it, and uh, hopefully down the road the mainstream media will be able to write on those issues as well. Because now it's going with track. I see track and field people. They're taking uh, young ladies. They're taking a lot of people from our community. And then if they once they earn that uh, state title for them, they drop them like, a, you know, hey, see you. You're gone. You're out of here. So fortunately, it's working out for Matt Jones. He's going to the University of Buffalo this fall. But what about all the, the Calvin Betts and some of the other uh, people that, that five, six years ago that graduated from some of these uh, private schools but, and did not get that college education or get into that school that they should have gotten into when they went to a high-quality prep uh, high school? So that's, that's my comment just on that situation, how you've got to have respect for the community when you're reporting. Report also on, from the people point of view. Find out, and it's still, obviously it's easier for us to gain that, but for the mass media, for them to gain trust, you have to, it's a two-way street. You just can't report it on one side. you got to come in and work harder to gain that trust. And down the road, hopefully some trust will be gained once you start showing that respect for the people. Thank you. Thank you. And that's why, I'm going to say something, and that's why, uh, before this brother here uh, makes his comment. That's why this is a, a wonderful start. This is a baby step, as we, we put it, toward beginning that dialogue. You know, just for, to be clear, what we do as an organization, we don't do it to be seen. We don't do it to be in the news and in the paper. We do it because we feel these are things that need to be done. It's just that simple. And we have the courage to do it. But it's not about grandstanding and all that other stuff. So we appreciate you probably way more than you even know by, uh, you know, by coming and participating. Because how else are people going to know how serious, we are serious and committed about changing the conditions of our people in this city and in this country. Serious. We won't know how serious and committed you are until we see how much you continue to participate. We value everyone's, you know, uh, opinion and information. But we're serious. We don't, we're not, this is just not today we do this and we had a nice discussion and uh, see you later. So we do have some follow-up steps. Some follow-up steps planned. And we really expect you to be a real integral part of that. And that's for real serious. 
Am I rambling? <laughs> I want to follow up to the question the young lady had, uh, who's a uh, college professor. And was that your brother or in law? Your uncle, okay. Uh, during that time frame, obviously he must have uh, got to somebody inside of the LA Times because to do the kind of writing and the extensive research, the background, it took time. But Julie was just talking about it. The four month endeavor that she was on. In today's environment, the way the big media companies, because they're profit driven, uh, gutting the uh, editorial boards, the writers, the staff, I mean, they're just consolidating. Even, I mean, look at the uh, DNC. There were, at one time, it was two pages speaking out in the editorial page. Now that's been reduced to just one page. I know Jim Lawson is about to have a heart attack down there. I'll do respect. No, this stuff is serious because, you know, I don't know if it's competition. I don't know if it's uh, the new medium, uh, YouTube, uh, uh, the Internet. Uh, are we reading less? Uh, I mean, we should be reading more if we're going to educate our, our young people and prepare them for this new technological society. But that kind of reporting, you see it with, still with some of the major newspapers, whether it's the Washington Post or the New York Times, but they have some resources that maybe some of the other financial institutions don't have. But I, I get back to what I said before, and uh, your, your uncle reminds me of the late Dead Stone because he did that series of articles before the riots happened here in 19, it was the early 60s, when he talked about housing condition, the lack of education, the lack of jobs, it's, it's just like a ship that goes to sea without a captain and a rudder. That's a recipe for disaster for anyone who's, ever, any, anyone who's had any marine experience. You never want to go into the Atlantic Ocean Pacific or Antarctica or anywhere unless you have a, a good captain and a good ship and somebody who knows what they're doing because you, you, it's, anything can happen. And if you're prepared, you, you, you stand a much better chance of surviving. So what I'm saying is that People in that generation, I mean, they were visionaries. They had a, 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 an idea of how society should operate. It should be an open, fair, and free and equitable society. And that wasn't happening across this country. And I want to say one other thing, and then I'm going to be quiet. If you remember, for those of you who've been around, the first Rodney King incident didn't happen in Los Angeles. This happened in Radiant Rochester. It was a, it was a, a, a gentleman. Rufus Farewell, who owned the service station, owned the service station at the corner of uh, Columbia and Plymouth Avenue, and was severely beaten by two Rochester police officers because they thought he worked there and he wasn't supposed to be there. And, and in fact, he just recently died. I think the DNC did a big a series of articles on him. But we've had some very serious problems in this community. And the only way we're going to work and solve those problems is for pe good people, good thinking people, goodwill people like the people I see here, the people that just put them to come together and work very hard and diligently to help turn this country around if we're going to have a country.
if there's a disproportionate number of positive stories about what's happening in the quote unquote white community or the suburban communities, and we don't get those same, get a, a proportionate number of positive images and stories about what is happening in the African American and, and color community, whether you say Hispanic, whatever, then it's not equal. And it doesn't take a lot to find positive stories in my community. I know that. And I know I would probably watch Channel 8 a lot more, or Channel 13, Channel 10, if I saw more positive things, because I do get minority reporter, and I'm very familiar with Mr. Blunt, and um, I'm sorry, I can't see the name of your paper, but I'm very familiar with these things, because they reflect me. And everything that happens in my house, I don't shoot people every day. I don't shoot people every week. I don't shoot people once a month. And neither does anybody in my family. And if one person, or if a small minority of the negative images that we see in the media is disproportionate to what I see, I'll call it racism. I'll say it's a black and white issue, whether we want to admit it or not, or whether we want to cover it up and say it's an economic, social logic, and all that other stuff. I'll call it for what it is because I don't watch it because I don't see it. I'm not Bill Cosby, but then again, I'm not shooting anybody. And I haven't seen that lady or that lady or anybody else in here shoot anybody. So is it sensationalism? Yes, because it's disproportionate to what's really happening in our community. So if you can answer how many positive stories you run, please do. If you can't, think about doing it. Next question, statement, and or comment. So since we have been giving soliloquies on this terrible thing called institutional racism, I refuse to allow my children to think that the images that are most prevalent to them are on a television or in your magazine. But when they wake up, or when they woke up in the morning, my dear, they saw their father getting up, going to work. Their father, who had a full academic scholarship to Carnegie Mellon University, who wanted to design that space shuttle, had to decide that because he became a father at 17, and his father was an assistant pastor of a Pentecostal church, had to get a job and take care of his child. So he joined the United States Army and became a ranger. And then he decided that he didn't just want to be all he could be, he wanted to be everything else, so he went special forces. And then he looked around and saw that he was fighting folks who had as much olive or black or whatever you want to call it in his skin. And they were not fighting against us. They were fighting against what people want not want to say, white folk. Well, my mother, God rest her soul, I never knew her, but she was one of them white folk. So there's something in me that desires to see this unity get real. How do we do that? Number one, we stop allowing other people, brothers and sisters, to define us by their terms. I've seen us as people go from Negroes to black to African American, and now we are black sometime, and the other time we're African American. But instead of being who we are inside, are you a person of morals and ethics? We can use excuses about guns and drugs, because surely we know that white America has allowed guns and drugs into our community. We know that. We solved that mystery a long time ago. But I have never pointed a gun in anger and shot at anyone other than who my government said shoot at. And then found out that that was wrong and asked for repentance. So when someone says, Bishop Tillman, how do we deal with this institutionalized racism? First of all, you get rid of all your role models because a role is played by an actor and the actor is a hypocrite. 
And you get folks who are life models, who live what they say all the way from Sunday to Sunday, and not just on Sunday, and got to cuss you out before they get out of the parking lot in the church. Monday hasn't even rolled around yet. They've lost what we thought they should have. My question to you, media, is if you need someone to help you get trust, all you got to do is link up to a, a trusted brother or sister in the community and let them take you where you need to go. All right, there's no mystery to that. And if you read Willie Lynch's papers, you know what kind of Negro or African American or black man that I am. Look at my hair, it's straight. Look at my skin, it's almost as white as yours. So I'm what's called the front door nigga. And then you get my brother whose hair is kicked your old. You might as well say it out in the open because it's being said in the dark closets of America. And then we get a darker one. We say, no, he can work in the factory. But this one right here, he's so eloquent. And oh, he didn't use that scholarship? No. But then I met that wonderful woman there who was an educator for 33 and a half years in the Rochester City School District. And she encouraged me to go back to school and get my paper. And yet, I have not sold a drug, I have not shot my brother, and I don't go around calling my sister bitches. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And that's the truth. And I'm glad and, that and we have this is not that form. And, and here's the form. Sir, please. Institutional racism. And institutional and institutional racism. I understand the form. I am more online than you believe. It. But no, not at all. Because if we say it in silence, once again, Holder said we are a nation of cowards. My question to you is, and and, and you know what? Y'all say, well, what kind of preacher is he? One that will tell you the truth, and then want to walk along with you to get to the point. Here's the point, y'all. You cannot determine in my household what the positive images are for black folks in America because my son has put in two tours, my daughter's the special assistant. Now, you say, well, what is all that? It's just an example of someone who wasn't really anyone special at all who said, if you put in an honest day's labor, my father taught me this. Fathers, are you responsible for the babies you made? Yeah, this is the forum. There is institutional racism. But instead of us coming up here and asking questions, I think you should be asking questions of us. Because it seems like you're the ones who's confused, because we're not confused. We know that racism is a lie. Now that's the point, and we are on point. All right. Promise me you won't curse. Places where they would speak. 
So again, it comes down to the issue of access, finding those people who can speak about politics, who can speak about the issue of the day. They're not as obvious. And again, it's, it's not a, it, it doesn't let us off the hook. But what I'm telling you is it does take a lot more time. It does take finding someone sometimes to walk us into the neighborhoods. And it's something that I hope all my colleagues are aware of. But again, and it's not an excuse, the economy has done a horrible thing to our newspaper, to our media outlets, consolidation of, big, uh, of the... I know Steve Daw personally would love to spend four months tracking down and finding the right people. Kenny, no. And I can't always either. Access is a huge problem. And it's something that you can wish away the economy and say that's an excuse, but it, it is an issue. And in order to overcome that, we need to be creative and constructive. And I'm hoping that that's something that comes out of this, is how do we get that access without spending months and money and time and, and finding it as easily as we find every one of those re-elected assembly members or other leaders in the community. Two more, and then all of these beautiful community members. Is that okay with you all? Okay. okay. There's a couple of comments that were left open and not answered, and uh, I just want to address those really quickly. Uh, the first one was a sister that came up here and said that we should have 12% of our stories represent uh, African Americans in a positive light. That number is too low. I, in our community, we have well over 40% black. So if you want to use a number, uh, I'd start at 40 and move, move upward on that, um, number one. Number two, um, Brother Tillman made a point about the uh, drugs and guns being an excuse. Uh, I, I take offense to that because that's the operating um, system in which we're, we're operating and we're living in. Our people are shooting each other and making life and death decisions under that system. And until, and I am a strong believer that until we eradicate those things out of our community, whether it takes, and it's going to take more than just black folks because we are, are in some ways uh, crippled and, out and, 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 and defeated and haven't, haven't uh, put together the will and, and built a community uh, systems and put together the, the desire or don't have the courage and don't have the support to do it ourselves, but we have to decide to do it. And we have to write about it we have to continue to put it on the news, on television, and we have to, and because what we're going to wind up doing is going to our graves with this problem if we don't take charge of it. And our babies are going to keep on shooting each other over a bag of do dope or standing out on the corners, and we're going to be complaining about it. And those that are still alive, after we're going, are going to be talking about the same things we're talking about tonight. And I, I, for one, can't live with that way. I, for one, don't accept that. Okay? So, I think a couple of the ideas that you, two people just made should serve as action items, whether it's RABJ or it's anti-racist movement or it's another community group. We're going to track the stories that appear in the papers, on the air, and find out just how imbalanced we are. So hopefully, for the next meeting, I'm going to take that, I'm going to make that commitment. Okay? And then we can move forward from there. And I'm going to pass this on to whoever else wants to add to that. Um, yeah, again, my name is Michelle Rice, and I'm with TV1. Um, and I'd like to answer the question that the lady said, how many story, positive stories have you run on your network? 100%. We are African-American owned and operated station, and that's why TV1 exists. And we are here to provide different views about African-Americans, our culture, from, like I said, from documentaries to a lot of different programs. The beauty of TV One is when we come into uh, a community, we partner with the local cable operator that carries us, and we do positive things in the community. 
Um, because the reality is, I know everyone's beating up on the news uh, folks here today, and I don't, you know, not to say they don't, they don't deserve it. Um, I don't live in the local community, but the reality is, if you look at the demographics and the ratings of who's watching news, I would, I would venture to guess it's not kids, um, or disproportionately not children. They are watching it violent, and this is about mass media on cable networks and television networks. So I would also encourage you to look at the lineup on your uh, cable channels and the things that they, and also hold them accountable for the things that they need to do in your communities. Um, and that's the only thing that I would say. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the, the issues, first of all, I want to say, you know, just to see everyone who's here tonight I think is a, is a really positive thing because it says that our community and the media in general in our community that we're open to the issues and we really want to understand them and, and do something about it. But you know the issue of, um, Julie you mentioned about not having access to the community or the community not trusting the quote unquote mainstream media, well you know that's, that's a reality. And in many ways, the media has earned that within our communities. You know, over and over, when you see an, an image is a very important thing. And when you see a TV camera and um, you have a, an African American and, and a Caucasian and, and the camera will zoom into the, the Caucasian speaking or, you know, leave out the African American, you see that? I see that. I, I look at those things, or the way a picture is pro portrayed, you know, within within the media. I'm not saying that WXXI does that <laughs> at all, but I'm saying that you know the the concerns in our com in the community is it's very real, and people um, uh, feel those concerns, and they in many ways just may not trust someone from the media just because they don't trust the way their comments may be portrayed in the media or, or just the way you know that article may be, may be written. So it's about really becoming sensitive to that. And I think sometimes, perhaps, even as media professionals, it's important to have um, um, some cultural sensitivity training and being able to understand the culture that we're dealing with. You know, um, obviously, I deal with an African with the African American community, so I'm African American. So it's easy to walk in and to, to speak with someone within the community. But if you're sending someone into the community to cover a story, why not send an African American reporter, or <laughs> make an effort to recruit more African Americans or have a, a diverse. Uh, group of, of people on, on, on the staff, and that's. Thank you. Good, 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 good. Over to our community here. Okay, good evening. And my name is Barbara Singleton. I'm an educator in the Rochester City School District. Um, I just wanted to comment. I, I, a lot of you. The comments that we had, um, I think we're on the same page here because I wrote down a lot of stuff that they said it before I got a chance to say. So um, what I really wanted to say was that I, I remember reading the book Shame of the Nation. When I read that book, it just brought back a lot of memories um, for me because I know about this institution, institutionalized racism. And I grew up in the South. When I came here, I was 14 years old. The schools were segregated where I lived. They were integrated, actually, but my mom and dad chose, they wanted us to go to um, segregated schools, which were good. So when I came here, I have already had a background of black literature, black history, and all of this black stuff. And, you know, it was pretty good because it made us realize who we were as a people. So as I was growing up, we didn't, we couldn't use the term like black or African American and all of that because I have Cherokee blood in me, I have Caucasian blood in me, and I have black blood in me. So I would, my father used to say his kids were all mixed up. <laughs> Turn on the page to Rochester City School District and the media that you're saying. I'm also um, 
Like I said, an educator. I'm an advocate for educational excellence for young adults. And I'm also a clergy. I'm an ordained chaplain. So I talk to a lot of the young people, like whenever there's a shooting or something, most of the time our chaplains will show up because we are the people that they trust. What we're finding out is that the, the young adults, they're getting tired of the racial profiling. Um, they're getting tired of the stereotyping. They're getting tired of going to the malls. And I wish that you people who are with this news, um, you need to go undercover to the malls. Something like the guy, like, like he did when he painted his skin portrayed himself as an African American and almost got the daylight swept out of him and all of this other good stuff that they go through, you know? So, I need for you to do me a favor. You need to just go in there in the mall and pretend that you are just, send, send some African American kids in there and see what happens. Because my kids went to the mall. I lived in the Gates area. They were thrown out of the mall because it was four of them together. My kids spent a lot of money. Media doesn't cover this, but this is what's going on with these kids, and they're frustrated. And I talk to them on maybe a daily basis. My sons were thrown out of the mall, and the cops actually told them, go back to the city where you belong. Okay, I was in the mall the other day with my kids shopping, and there were about 20, I would say 20, Caucasian kids that were walking through the mall's hoodies on everything, black trench coats. Make up all over their face, cops didn't say nothing to them. My kids were dressed, you know, dressed, haircuts, everything, but they got thrown out of the mall. The other thing is that a lot of these teens, when you're writing stories about them, they have grandfathered out of Boys and Girls Club, Pop Warner, all of this good stuff that they did when they were younger. They have nothing to do because of the negative portrayal of African American children, young adults. The other thing is, um, I think that these kids, they, they need to be able to discuss issues that are crucial to their well-being and their survival. So what can you do about this? I mean, can you set it up where they can have roller skating in the city again, things to do once they're grandfathered from these other organizations? And I also want to make a comment that I think people of color has come a long way. Um, in a short period of time, because to say that the grandfathers and the great grandparents were denied an education, I think these kids need to be, they, they need to be some kind of positive comments about the accomplishments that they made to say that we were denied so much. Instead of all this negativity, you know, it's setbacks for them. And that's when all of this hanging out and all of this other stuff comes in. So if you want them to win your trust, which they are, I'm pretty sure they're not going to do it because of this long trail that they have right now. I'm thinking that, like the guy was saying, you need to probably think about talking to your administrators or your bosses or whatever and hiring more people of color to do your media work because once you show up in these neighborhoods, it's already a barrier that's going to, they're just going to throw an iron gate in front of you. They don't trust you. And you know why it is? Because I'm not going to be ashamed to say this because of your skin color. You cannot go into an African American community and expect for them to embrace you. And I don't think it has a lot to do with fear. I think it has a lot to do with, like you say, just a distrust. They, they just don't trust you. But you're going to have to like win their trust because, trust me, there's a ghetto grapevine. They got a lot of news, news that you would never even know about. But they would tell it to us as clergy. But until they win your trust, if you want to know anything, you ask the kid in those neighborhoods, and they know more than the adults do. So my question to you again is what you're going to do about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what I want to say is, due to time constraints, hopefully our gracious panel, you know, would accept if we can get as many comments questions as briefly as possible so that we can try to get them all in before we move on to our social time. Hopefully we can all, you know, agree with working together. You know. Thank you. 
Um, good evening. My name is, is Pat Mannix, and I'm from um, the Metro Justice Racial Justice Committee and Moving Beyond Racism. Um, first, I want to um, thank ARM for putting together this wonderful panel. And I certainly hope that when it's reported, that they get credit for it. Um, I noticed that the last wonderful panel they had, it, they weren't given any credit in any media for having that. And so, well, I'm sorry, I didn't see yours. <laughs> but um, it's really important that these things do get credited and not, you know, not just the, the story. I want to thank all of you for coming. I'm having worked in community issues for over 25 years. I'm amazed to see you all here. And Gary, I especially want to take, uh, signal you out because I heard your wonderful commentary at the Little Theater after the film, and I was so struck by the honesty of your comments. I really appreciated that. And it was so under-attended, it, it really was sad. Uh, the wonderful series of films that they had both at the Little and at WXXI celebrating Black History Month have been so grossly under-attended, under it, it really has been sad. Okay, that's the positive. On the negative, um, two weeks ago, uh, tomorrow, I think I was about as angry about media coverage as I have ever been in all of the years I've been in Rochester. And the story I'm referring to, it, it wasn't just the story. The thing I want to bring up that's a little different was the placement of the story. We all know in the newspaper that above the fold is everything. And above the fold on the front page is beyond everything. The rage I felt looking at the Democratic Chronicle on that morning, I can't even tell you. I'm so glad to be here today so I can talk about it. There was a story on the cover about um, the bankers, our wonderful bankers, testifying before the Senate to all of their fraud and deceit and everything else they've done to contribute to the breakdown of our whole economic system. The important story belonged above the fold. Below the fold, on that same page, was a smaller story about the murderers from the peanut company in Georgia who knowingly sent out uh, contaminated products into our marketplace to kill people. But above the fold, juxtaposed to the banker's story, was the story of this extremely dangerous black criminal in our community who had dared to send her children to the Greece School District and stole education. I think that the story, of course, you could expect it to be reported, but above the fold on the front page, I don't think so. And if this doesn't scream of racism, I don't know. So unprepared um, to really face the challenges that are before us. 
Um, and I'll just draw one kind of example of what I'm talking about. I see a, a tremendous amount of cross-promotion, um, especially on corporate channels that have a uh, national network behind them. Of, you know, in the news, we're seeing a promo about American Idol or Desperate Housewives or one of those other shows. And I'm just wondering, we have 22 minutes of news time. Do we need to waste any of it promoting an entertainment show? And that's a concern I have. The kids know everything about American Idol and Desperate Housewives. <laughs> they know nothing about the context of the world in which they live in. And I find that a grave concern. district student and a member of Rochester Students for a Democratic Society. Um, I first wanted to um, I first wanted to um, add to the comment that was made about the woman who stole education for her children. Um, in addition to the racism in that story, one of the things that people need to realize and that the media needs to acknowledge is that quality education is a universal human right. Therefore, you cannot steal it. questions. Um, the first one, just out of curiosity, um, shortly after um, the Taekwon Rivera story uh, was on all the television media, and this is directed at, at the three uh, corporate television uh, people because I noticed you've been oddly quiet uh, lately. Um, there was a story uh, around the same time of a white person, I believe in Brockport, who killed three people. And I, f I found that there was a really um, weird discrepancy between the black city youth who allegedly shot, definitely did not kill a police officer, and the coverage of a serial killer. Um, one was white in the suburbs, got so much less media attention compared to the circus around Taekwon Rivera's story. Um, I would like to ask if any of the three of you would be willing to admit that that is an example of institutional racism within your own Hold, hold on one second, please. Sir, one second, please. Since, um, due to time constraints, try to remember which questions you'd like to answer, and let's get all the questions and concerns in first. Because, what, what? One, this is not, once again, this is a dialogue in the community discussion. This is not about bashing any of the panelists, first of all. Secondly, I am trying to get everyone's questions and comments in. And if we continue to do this, we're going to, it's not going to work out. I'll, I'll be brief. The, we, we had a ton of coverage of that shooting of the, four, the five people three in Brownport, two who were killed, and two who were held hostage in their home in Canandaigua and murdered execution style. I mean, as I mentioned before, there have been two murders in the city this year and four in the surrounding area, and we've covered those. To say that we haven't, or to say there was a disproportionate amount of coverage is absolutely incorrect. I have a, I have a second question, uh, if that's all right. Um, just in response to that, though, uh, I don't remember seeing footage from cameras at that person's arraignment, you like there was at Taekwon Rivera's. Um, my, my second question, though. Just, just to answer that, there were six cameras there. I All mean, right. and it ran many, many times. It'll probably run again as each court proceeding happens. All right. Hold, it, hold, it. Maybe I hold on, hold on. First rule, respect the facilitator. What's going on here is, actually, this is a, this is a training exercise for me because I need to learn patience. And I need to learn humility, and I need to learn to control my emotions, me to control my passion. So I'm sure everyone here is willing to work with me and help me with that. So could you please get to your point, and we can move on with the next questions and responses, and I would, I would be so grateful. Thank um, you. My, my second question was um, whether any of the three of you could provide a good reason that there is no media coverage that I have seen, at least, and maybe I missed it again, um, of when white police kill black men in the city, and black women for that matter, when white police kill black civilians in the city, and it does happen, 
and there is little to no media coverage that I've been able to find. The only one I could find was from Oakland when Oscar Grant was shot, and that only happened after there were riots in Oakland. That is shameful, and I would ask if any of you can explain that. I'd like to remind you a little time to think about that one anyway. school student. 
And, and when we talk about institutional things, it's sometimes hard because they're staring you in the face all the time. I will call your attention and you can pay attention to it as you leave. The nice drawing on the wall over here that shows the heroic de la Salle exploring the new world with the subservient Native Americans kneeling in front of them. Those are the kinds of images that, that you know, pervade in society. And we don't have to so, so what I would ask you as, as representatives of the media, as a, as a, a body here, is, is to really think about what your collective opportunity for responsibility might be here. When you come out into the community, don't assume that there's a spokesperson for the black community. There is no spokesperson for the black community. Um, you know, take a look at, at how you can help us understand some of this history, not just in February, when, when it's black history, but the rest of the year too. And, and, and take a look at how collectively we might address some of these issues of crime and violence and school performance and graduation rates and, and the resegregation of the school district. We have a more segregated school district today than, than existed in the Deep South in 1950. And I don't see anybody working. So what I'm asking you is really think about how we can not just protect the status quo, but really promote change. And, and, and in closing, I would just like to compliment the Democrat Chronicle for the series that they've run over the past four weeks on African-American families who've been here from multiple generations back into the 1700s. More often than not, when people think about African-Americans, they assume that they all came to Rochester somehow in a big bus in 1950, and that was it. There is a very deep and very rich history of people in this community that goes back for many generations. Thank you. And I agree, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe Austin Stewart was one of those people that we don't hear enough about in any media in Rochester.
proof to the proven innocent. I don't need no help from you to get convicted. Keep, keep it balanced. Um, and so that everybody can draw their own conclusion. Um, during Harry Tubman time, she not only would have been convicted, she probably would have been hung, but now she's a hero. The way they're doing this lady in Greece is ridiculous. To somebody, she's probably a hero. It could be a hero. Give her a chance. We ain't even give her a chance. Do just be unbiased with the coverage. It is so important. Perception, somebody said it up here, is so, uh, it's, it's, it's more important than the truth. Uh, I'm going to just give you one quick example. I went with my wife. We went out in the suburbs, out in the sticks. I got what you call a do-rag. Try to keep my hair padded down. I got out the car. I didn't want to smoke a cigarette in the car. I seen the state trooper coming. I had to snatch the do-rag off because I had to worry about, because of the racism, worry about him thinking it's a coupe. If he's thinking I'm a Muslim, out here in the middle of nowhere, I'm gonna, I might not make it back home. These are the different types of things that a black man has to, man, I go into the store, if it's late at night, I gotta pull my wallet out ahead of time and let him see I got some money. I ain't coming in here to rob. These are, you know, so please, it's a lot. I'm not blaming you for the racism, but I'm telling you we need you in order to try to peel this off. It's, we can't, we can't um, try to solve this without your help. You're not the root of it, but we need we need your help. But we.